And our studies, as you know, for this time period is Peter's conversion. And the title of this study is really taken from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ that he says in Luke 22 and verse 32, of when he's trying to prepare Peter for what lay ahead on the night of his betrayal, that Peter really wasn't where he thought he was in terms of his loyalty to the Lord, in terms of his readiness to face what would probably be one of the biggest challenges of his life. Jesus says to Peter there in Luke 22 and verse 32, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now just put yourself in Peter's position here for a minute. He's been with the Lord for three and a half years. And now Jesus is telling him, you're not converted? Imagine what would have been going through Peter's mind. All the things that he had left behind. And now his Lord is telling him in front of the rest of the disciples, you're not yet converted, Peter. But how could he be with the Lord day in and day out and still not be converted? This was a question that puzzled me. It was intriguing. And I wanted to understand more. What was it that Peter was lacking in regards to his faith or his commitment to Christ? What was missing there? And what can we learn in our lives? It's not taking a shot at Peter or painting him in a negative light. Because we know that Peter was really one of the best friends of the Lord Jesus Christ that he went on to play an absolutely pivotal role in the spread of the gospel in the first century ecclesia. But even such a man as Peter, who was blessed with learning in the presence of the Lord every single day, was still lacking in some regard. What was it? How about us? Would we consider ourselves to be converted? How many years has it been since we committed our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ, to follow in his footsteps, But commitment and conversion are not the same thing. We know that colloquially, when we hear in the world today that somebody has joined a new religion, it's, well, they've been converted to that religion. But that's not how the Lord Jesus Christ uses it. When we take a look at this aspect of conversion, it means to turn oneself about, to do a 180-degree turn. But was Peter really that far off? Are we that far off? Is that possible? that we could be involved in ecclesial life, that we could be doing things day in and day out, involved in organization of different activities within the ecclesia, and still not truly be converted in our hearts. This week I'd like for us to ponder together Peter's conversion and to think about his life as it relates to our lives and what it is that we can learn from this beloved disciple as he followed the Lord Jesus Christ and went on to become a very pivotal member of the early Ecclesia. When you take a look at Peter, and you think about how many times he comes up in the New Testament, there's nobody that's named by name more than Peter outside of the Lord Jesus Christ. I counted 183 times that Peter came up, whether it was Simon or Simon Peter, or Peter or Cephas. The next most common, as you would probably expect, is Paul, right behind him at 182 times. But it falls off pretty significantly after that. John the Baptist at 89 times. And then John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, comes up just 46 times. The disciple who's named most often after Peter. Peter's life spans from the beginning of the gospel accounts all the way through to 2 Peter. So this is rather expansive when you consider the man Peter and his involvement in the work of the spreading of the gospel. So how is it that we can effectively cover such a broad topic, a man like Peter, to learn from his journey and at the same time to do justice to the study? We won't be able to cover everything exhaustively. We can put that to bed right away. But just put in your mind going through a museum. And in a particular museum, you may have a time period of history. And as you're walking along that time period, you can get a macroscopic view of the events that took place during that time period. But there'll be specific call-outs along the way, blurbs of information that mark significant things that were very important, that characterized and colored that time period. So you could get an overall view, but you can also understand the key events that marked that time period. That's how we'd like to cover the life of Peter. To take a look at the narrative macroscopically, to walk in his shoes, to see what he experienced, but to take strategic pauses along the way to see what were those key events 
that really changed Peter and that turned him from Simon into Peter. This is the format that we'd like to follow, and this is the outline for our classes together. You can see along the top side here some of the events that take place that aren't really the key events in Peter's life, but nonetheless mark the time periods of Jesus' ministry, of Jesus' death, of the Acts of the Apostles, and the writing of the first and second epistles of Peter, and the dates that correspond to those along the bottom. And as we walk along chronologically with Peter, we'll cover each of these sections in some level of detail. Our first class is Answering the Call, which really looks at where Peter answers the call of the Lord Jesus Christ and makes the commitment to follow the Lord. Three times Jesus had to call Peter before he eventually made that commitment to leave everything behind. The second is learning to be a disciple about the next year of the Lord's ministry. So this first class covers the first two years or so. Then the next class will cover the third year of the Lord's ministry. It's where Peter learns not just who he's following, but what it really means to be a disciple, what it means to follow in the footsteps of his Lord. The third class will be struggling with faith and facing failure, of where we'll zoom in very particularly on the events that colored in the denial of the Lord Jesus Christ and to see what it is that Peter struggled with there and how the Lord continued to work with him even in that darkest hour. We'll then consider the conversion of Peter in John chapter 21 to see where Jesus speaks to Peter as he hauls in those fish and asks him three times, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he helps Peter to see what it really means to be a disciple and to be an apostle. We'll then move on to see his apostleship of where he unlocks the kingdom using the keys of the kingdom that the Lord Jesus Christ had given to him as he spreads the gospel message, feeding the flock of God. And finally, in our last consideration, we'll see this element of shepherding, of where Peter reflects back on his whole life, and he tries to distill down for the believers, these are the key elements if you want to be faithful. This is what I've learned from my entire life of service to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the goal of our study then will be to use Peter's conversion to assess our own, and to see where we're at, to get actionable things that we can do better, that we might draw closer to our Lord. So with this glimpse of where we hope to go this week, I'd like to begin our studies together to see how it is that Peter answered the call. When you hear the name Simon Peter, what comes to mind? What do you think about when you hear Simon Peter? What events just pop up. Quite often the things that we think about with Simon Peter are the points of failure, of when he walks on the water but finds himself sinking, of when he proclaims to the Lord, I'm going to be faithful, but denies the Lord three times, of when he's pulling Jesus off to the side and Jesus has to rebuke him, get thee behind me, Satan, or when he falls asleep in the garden. For some reason these points come up in our minds as characterizing Peter. The impulsivity of this man, of where he acts first and thinks later. But I don't think that's how Jesus saw Peter. I think because Scripture lays the life of Peter bare, it's very easy for us to focus on those things. But I don't believe that's what made Peter the man who he was and the leader that he would eventually become in the ecclesia of Christ. When you take a look at Peter... What would you see first when you were introduced to the man? Well, I believe that standing before you would be a physically strong fisherman. We get indications of this from different references that come up. For example, in John 21 and verse 11, when they catch the 153 great fish, Peter's not asking for help for anyone else to pull these fish up, but the record's very clear that Peter does it by himself. Over 300 pounds of fish, Peter's just hauling it up. Don't worry about it, guys, I got this. Clearly, a big man. When they're running to the tomb, him and John are running together. John inserts a little note there in John 20 and verse 4, we both ran to the tomb, but well, I outran him, right? He, he doesn't refer to himself personally, but he tells you that he was a little bit faster than Peter, perhaps because Peter was a little bit bigger in stature physically. You take a look as well that he had a zeal to be with Jesus. He goes out and walks on the water in Matthew 14. He runs to see the empty tomb. He can't walk. He can't wait for somebody else's report. He's often running to the tomb. 
He jumps out of the boat to swim. He can't wait for the boat to get to shore in John 21. He's out swimming to shore to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And he endures many rebukes that would cause many of us to crumble. Get thee behind me, Satan. How many of us have been called Satan by our best friend? Not many of us. But Peter continues to press through those things because he wanted to be with Jesus more than anything else in the world. He's intensely loyal. Like many of the other disciples, he left a prosperous occupation to be with Jesus and to follow him. He stays with Jesus. When many of the other disciples, not of the twelve, but many others leave at the end of John chapter 6, when Jesus is telling them to eat my flesh and drink my blood, Jesus turns around and says, will you also leave? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. He was ready to stand beside Jesus, even to the point of death, as he professed in Matthew 26 and verse 35, that I will die with you. And we know that he didn't at that time. But you don't, you don't take a sword to somebody and try to chop off their head when you're completely outnumbered unless you're willing to die with someone. Peter was willing to do that at that moment in time. Peter was also a charismatic leader. He was the spokesman, it would seem, for the disciples. When people ask a question, it's very often Peter that speaks up. And there's a number of references here that indicate this. The rest of the disciples seem to be okay with this. Yes, there's squabbles about who's going to be the greatest, but Peter continues to be the spokesman for the disciples. And even though Peter is not the first one called, he is always the first disciple who is listed, not just self-assertion, but by the divine account. Peter is always listed first, whether it be the 12, the inner three, it doesn't matter. Simon Peter is listed at the beginning, as you can see here in these references. He's impulsive. He walks on the water. Never seeing a man walk on the water before, but he's out in the middle of a storm, walking on the water to be with Jesus. The transfiguration in Mark 9, he doesn't know what to say, so he says, well, let's build three tabernacles. He speaks up because... He doesn't know what else to do. He cuts off the, the ear of the high priest's servant in John chapter 18. He runs into the empty tomb. John's looking inside, a little bit tentative, trying to figure out what's going on. Well, not Peter. Good old Peter, he's straight into the tomb. Where's Jesus? Looking around, right in the thick of things. And he jumps into the water, as we've already mentioned. Doesn't need to think twice. All he knows is that Jesus is on shore. Nothing else to think about. Got to get to Jesus. And he's self-confident a man of natural abilities, of natural charisma. It would be easy to rely on those abilities. And Jesus touches on this in John chapter 21 when he says, when you were young, you clothed yourself. You did the things that you wanted to do, but that's not going to be the way it is when you get older, Peter. You're going to need to rely on me. He actually pulled Jesus aside and rebuked him. And Jesus has to tell him, that's not how it works, Peter. You're following me, not me following you in Matthew 16. And he separates himself from the rest of the disciples. Though everyone else will be offended, Lord, not I. I will not be offended. I'm in a different position than the rest of the disciples. And so if you were to summarize this, you could see that he was a physically strong fisherman. He had a zeal to be with Jesus. He was intensely loyal, a charismatic leader. He was impulsive and he was self-confident. And when we look at Peter, quite often what we see from the record is this element of impulsivity. But I believe that when Jesus looked at Peter, as we'll see in our studies this week, that what it is that Jesus saw was this zeal and this desire to be with Jesus. That this is what colored the life of this man. That this is what motivated him above everything else. This was the most readily identifiable characteristic that Peter possessed, was to be with Jesus more than anything else in the world. And because of that, Peter was willing to allow Jesus to change who he was. And as we walk with Peter, we walk with Peter through the highs and lows of his life. It's not a steady ascent, a steady climb to the kingdom for Peter. But there's major highs and major lows. And as we look at Peter, we find ourselves loving this man. Because the authenticity and the transparency of Peter just leap off the page and pull us in. There's no hidden agendas with Peter. What you see is what you get. You know exactly where he's at. Some people we have to learn to love. They're a bit of an acquired taste, <laughs> but not with Peter. Peter is a very loving individual, somebody that just draws us into the record. And we find ourselves relating to this man.
and seeing ourselves in him. Peter's walk was marked by significant elevation changes. Highs that were so high that they extended even into the heavens themselves. Of seeing the Lord transfigured, receiving a sight of the future glory that awaited, and lows that were so low that you wonder, will he ever recover from this? Marked by regret and bitter tears. Yet through it all, the Lord was converting Peter to be the rock that he needed him to be. What about us in our lives? A lot of us like to envision that the pathway to the kingdom is a steady ascent. But we know the reality that faces us, that challenges beset us on every side. And we look at these challenges and we say, these things are obstacles preventing us to get from, to the kingdom. But the reality is that without these challenges, we would not get to the kingdom. Peter would not have been converted if he did not have these challenges in his life if he didn't have these trials before him. And so one of the things that we need to recalibrate in our mind, as difficult as it is, as we go through the studies this week, is to see the challenges in our lives as they're supposed to be seen. These are the necessary elements in our lives that will result in our conversion. And without these things, we will not be converted to be the disciples that Jesus needs us to be. This is one of the main points that comes out early on in the life of Peter. So when are we introduced then to Peter the man? Well, the first introduction that we have is in John chapter 1, if we could turn there for a moment. This is the first calling of Peter. And you'll recall that I mentioned that there's three separate callings that we'll go through before Peter finally makes the commitment to leave it behind. John chapter 1 Verses 40 to 44 is the section of where we're introduced to Peter. Now, by occupation, as many of us know, Simon, Andrew, James, and John were all fishermen. Simon and Andrew were both of Bethsaida, as you can see here on the northeast corner of the Sea of Galilee. But by the time that we get to this record, they're actually over in Capernaum, a few miles to the west. It seems that business drew them over there. And in fact, we find that Peter has a house there in Mark chapter 1 and verse 29, this is where Simon's house was, quite often where the Lord Jesus Christ would take up residence when he was in Capernaum. But it's interesting to note that when Simon Peter is first introduced to Jesus, it's not up in Capernaum. It's not up in Bethsaida. It's not up in that region at all. Peter's not just going about his daily life. In fact, where they're first introduced to Jesus is down in Bethabara in John 1 and verse 28, where John the Baptist is baptizing. That's about 80 miles to the south, more than a few days' journey. And so you begin to wonder, well, what exactly is Peter and the others doing down south that far? And I'd suggest that what it indicates is that Peter and the others were actively looking for Messiah. They had heard of the work of John the Baptist. They knew of the prophecies that were given. And as a result, they were looking for the coming of Messiah. They were actively pursuing, trying to find out who the Messiah was. Well, Andrew and John are the first two disciples to see Jesus, as we're told in verse 37. It doesn't come right out and tell us that, but when you put the pieces together, you can figure out that it's actually Andrew and John there. And John the Baptist had just identified them, in, or just identified Jesus, rather, in verse 36, that this was the Lamb of God. And so put yourself now in their shoes, in Andrew and John. You've traveled down to the south to try to figure out who the Messiah is, and John the Baptist has just told you, that's the Lamb of God. Thousands of years of history, great anticipation from generation after generation, and now you have just been told that that's the Messiah. So they begin following behind Jesus, looking at him, wondering who he is. Is this really the Messiah? And what happens with the penetrating gaze is Jesus immediately turns behind and says, what are you looking for? Not who are you looking for, but what are you looking for? And this penetrating gaze that Jesus was known for, to see beyond the surface, straight through them. That's the question that each of us needs to answer in our walk in the truth. What are we looking for? Why are we following Jesus? What are we involved in ecclesial life for? For? 
Do we have the answer to this question? I'm sure that they would have had the answer right away because that's what they were down there for. But no doubt it would have thrown them off. And he goes on to call them back to where it was that he was residing. It's interesting to note here in verse 38 that when it says that Jesus turned, that's the same root word that's used for conversion, a turning about. So Jesus is turning around to see what they're looking for. And so they're excited. They learn that Jesus truly is the Messiah, and they go and tell their brothers in verse 41. Now note where the focus is here, because Jesus is going to need to adjust this focus. They say, we have found the Messiah in verse 41. We have found him in verse 45. But Jesus says, well, hold on a minute. I have actually found you. Jesus beheld him and said, thou art Simon in verse 42. The record says that Jesus found Philip in verse 43, that Jesus saw Nathanael in verse 47. And he makes it very clear in verse 48 that before Philip called thee, I saw thee in verse 48. Unless there was any uncertainty at all, when Peter makes that proclamation at the end of John 6, that, Lord, thou hast the words of eternal life, he says, have not I chosen you twelve? It's great that they had made the choice, but the choice was only presented to them because God had extended it to them through His Son. God had given them the opportunity. And that's the same thing for each one of us, as we were reminded yesterday in the exhortation, that we've been called to be a generation of priests. And so it's not something that we can flippantly walk away from and decide, well, I'm interested or not. But this calling and election that comes first is a great privilege that we have the opportunity to then answer. It's our privilege to make this decision to follow Christ. And this is being laid out to Peter and to the others right from the beginning. Well, Simon Peter is brought then in verse 42. And it tells us that he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, this is Simon now, he says, Thou art Simon the son of Jonah, thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. This word beheld conveys a much deeper meaning than just looking at somebody. It actually conveys the meaning of really sizing someone up. Like, for example, you look at how this word is used in other instances. In Mark 14 and verse 67, when this maid is sitting and looking at Peter, she's really studying him intently, trying to place him. This is when he's sitting around the fire. And she finally identifies him as one of Jesus' disciples. It's the same look that Jesus gave Peter in Luke 22 and verse 61 when it says that Jesus looked upon Peter. This was right after Peter betrayed Christ for the third time. He looked upon Peter intently, a gaze once again that would have looked through the man and it would have studied him, sized him up, and made an assessment right away. The natural eye would have seen a strong fisherman, but we know that Jesus didn't judge after the sight of his eyes or the hearing of his ears, but he could see what was inside man. He didn't need anyone to tell him. And so there's no nice things that are spoken of here of, hey, how you doing? And I'm Jesus, I'm, I'm the Messiah. Look at what's spoken here. Thou art Simon, son of Jonah. You're going to be called Cephas. That'd be like somebody walking up and saying, Dave, you're the son of John. I'm going to call you Frank now. You'd be like, what's going on? Right? Who, who is this person? And what Jesus is telling Peter right away is I'm going to redefine who you are. That when you come to follow me, who you are today is not going to work. I'm going to change your identity. These are not minor tweaks that Jesus is talking about when he speaks to Simon. But imagine how this would have been taken by somebody who was strong, who was confident, who was charismatic, who had these abilities that the way that you are today is not going to work. I'm going to change you. That would have taken a great deal of humility to listen to that. We don't find Peter saying anything in opposition at this point. He's taking it all in. He's just been told that this is the Messiah. Think about that, though, for a moment. This was a sign of authority to name somebody else. It was an elevated position, just like Adam named his wife. Adam named the creation, so now Jesus is naming his disciple. And when we come to Jesus, 
It's the same thing for each and every one of us. He's going to transform our characters and to give us a new identity. And that transformation process is rather difficult. It takes time. God doesn't call us based on who we are today. God calls us based on who we are to become. And this was a critical element that he's laying out to Peter from the beginning. Well, at this point, Simon Peter doesn't have a lot to go on other than the fact that he's been introduced to Jesus. But Jesus goes on to show his disciples many things. Because from this point in John chapter 2, they go to the wedding in Cana of Galilee. And it tells us that a direct result of that was that his disciples believed on him. That this miracle was done for their intent, that the water pots corresponded to these disciples. As they would continue to travel, they would go to Jerusalem. And they would see the overturning of the tables of the money changers. Who was this man that could come in and challenge the status quo? that could speak about how you've turned my father's house into a den of thieves. This was a man with authority that could do these things. And as they traveled back up to the north, they would pass through Samaria. And they would disdainfully find him speaking to the woman at the well in John 4. Don't you know who this woman is? Why are you speaking to her? And they would see that Jesus was not a respecter of persons, that the kingdom was available to anyone, Jew or Gentile, who was willing to listen and the impact that it had on the whole village of those in Samaria. And with this fresh in their mind, they would experience the contrast of where Jesus goes to Nazareth and is rejected by his own people, by the Jews, after just being accepted by a group of Samaritans. This would have been rather confusing and puzzling for the disciples as they're taking all these things in. And then Jesus goes on to heal the nobleman's son in Cana of Galilee. We can read through these events rather quickly, but it would have been about seven to eight months worth of time when you look at the chronology. That's a long time to step away from your daily activity. Remember, Peter had a business. He had a wife. He had a life before he met the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't know about you, but when you're involved in ecclesial life, you have a due date coming up, whether it's a, a Bible school or, or some, something that you're organizing, and you can get very busy and other things begin to pile up. And you think, hey, I just got to get through this milestone here, and then I'm going to get back to some of the things that are piling up in other elements of my life. And I believe that a certain amount of that was happening with Peter. Because when they get back up to the north, and Jesus is teaching in Capernaum week after week, what we find is that Peter's gone back to fishing. Because in Mark chapter 1, we have the second calling now. No longer in the south, but up in Capernaum, of where Jesus tells him about a year and two months into the ministry, to leave it behind, and to follow him. So Jesus does appeal to Peter again, and Peter does walk away. But he doesn't walk away permanently at this point. Instead, Jesus continues to work with Peter. He knows that it takes time to make a commitment. He doesn't expect the commitment right away. And he does the same thing with each and every one of us. He knows it takes time to make the commitment. And he continues to work in our lives. But the expectation is that we will make a commitment. And so what Jesus does is he actually goes and stays at Peter's house. We read about this in chapter 1 and verse 29. That he took up residence in Peter's house. And in the process of time they were astonished at his doctrine. Because he taught as one that had authority and not as the scribes. But just imagine for Peter what this would have done for him. It wasn't just a visiting speaker coming into town. It was the Lord Jesus Christ staying at his house and the whole town coming to the door of his house to hear words of wisdom that had never been spoken before. Just imagine what that would do to your faith, to have Jesus Christ staying at your house. Now, for some of us, that might be a frightening prospect. Suddenly, the sheets would come out. We start covering things up in our house or... Or maybe, I don't know what the case would be, but if Christ came to our house, what impact would that have on our faith? Because the whole city came to his house and Peter's mother-in-law was healed. You have a sick family member. Jesus heals them outright. No lead time, no delay. The person is made whole. This is what Peter would have been experienced as he was watching the Lord Jesus Christ live in his house. But the time came with the third calling of where he expected 
a real commitment to be made. And that comes in Luke chapter 5, verses 10 and 11, which is where we'll spend the rest of our time together. It's actually Luke 5, about the first 12 verses, as we'll see together. The third calling, if you could just turn there for a moment, in Luke chapter 5. It took time for Peter to fully commit, but when the time came, he did make the commitment. This is a time here when Jesus is preaching to the multitudes. And what we're told here in Luke chapter 5 and verse 1 is that the multitudes were pressing upon him. The people were pressing upon him to hear. And we can read over that quickly, but it's significant as to why they were here. They were actually there to listen to what Jesus had to say. You can contrast that with different instances in time. Like in John 6 and verse 2, the people were there for miracles. They wanted the fish and bread, but not these people. These people were actually here to listen to the Word of God. And when you read about the situation and what was taking place, trying to put a bit of a word picture in our minds, it tells us that the multitudes pressed upon Him. That literally means that they were right on top of Him. When Jesus is cooking the fish in John 21, it tells us that He was cooking the fish on the fire. That's the same Greek word. So the people were right on top of Jesus. Jesus is in the multitude. He's trying to teach the people. He's trying to project. But these people are all on top of him. He can't be effective in his current position. And so as he's looking around for a way to improve his effectiveness, he sees two floating pulpits, two boats. And he decides that he's going to go into those to improve his effectiveness as he teaches. Well, these two ships belong, we're told, in verse 2, to fishermen. The fishermen were gone out of them. But ironically, these boats actually belonged to the disciples. In verse 10, we're told that one of them belonged to Zebedee, and the other one belonged to Peter in verse 3. So why not tell us that these were the disciples' boats? Why identify them as the fishermen's boats? And I think what Luke is subtly telling us here is that Jesus still has a little bit of work to do to change these fishermen into disciples. So what are these fishermen doing? These disciples. The multitudes are gathered together to hear the word, and these fishermen, at the end of verse 2, are washing their nets. So think about the contrast here. The reason they're washing their nets, as we find later in verse 5, is because they were out all night and had taken nothing. So clearly they're frustrated, probably not really interested in hearing a lot of classes at this point because they just pulled an all-nighter and they had nothing to show for it and now they had to clean up as a result. So Jesus is teaching from Simon's boat and as he's teaching, he can look to the side and see Simon, not really interested doing something else entirely. That would be pretty distracting for somebody to try to be giving an address and to look out and to see that one of your closest friends is just totally not engaged at all in what you're talking about. But Jesus doesn't address it at this point. Remember, Jesus is the greatest teacher to ever walk the planet. And so what he does is he finishes up with the multitude in verse 4. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. Now, What's really interesting is whenever the word Simon comes up in the account, it indicates for us that a learning opportunity is coming his way. And I'd just like to outline this, just a quick excursion, because it's a significant point. When Simon is mentioned alone, without Peter, it means that a learning opportunity is coming his way. Simon specifically means hearing. But in the absence of anything else, what is he doing with what he's hearing? Is he really taking action on it? So, for example, in Mark chapter 1, when Jesus calls him the second time, it's his identification before he commits to following. In Luke 5 and verse 4, it's where he's identified here a number of times as only Simon while he's washing his nets while Jesus is talking. Matthew 17 and verse 25, the man comes and says, well, does your master pay the temple tax? Peter replies right away, yep, he does. And Jesus says, well, Simon, where are you going? And he needs to correct him that the children are free, that we're not really bound to do this. 
Luke 22 and verse 31, where Jesus predicts the threefold denial of Simon Peter. Mark 14 and verse 37, where he has to wake Peter up in the Garden of Gethsemane. He calls him Simon. And in John 21, verses 15 to 17, when he's questioned three times, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And so you can imagine as Simon would have heard his name come up at various points in the ministry, he would have perhaps cringed a little bit like, uh-oh, what's coming my way this time? And so in this particular instance, as Jesus is speaking to him, he tells him in verse 4, Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a drought. And this word deep is bathos, which literally means something deep, but figuratively, it can mean the deep things of the word. Like, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10, Paul uses it to mean the deep things of God. And so it's almost as though Jesus is saying to Peter, Peter, let's get out of the shallows. I've got some real things for you to think about. I've got some deep things for us to consider together. And he says, let down your nets for a drought. There's nothing tentative here in what Jesus is saying. He says, we're going to catch fish. Now you can imagine how audacious that would seem at first glance to somebody who's a professional fisherman. That a carpenter is going to come and tell him, after he's tried to fish all night and caught nothing, that we're going to go out and catch fish now. And you can note a bit of the annoyance here in the way that Simon replies to this response. What he says in verse 5, he says, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, the word that he uses to identify Christ is not a common word that you'd use for somebody who you respect. It's not curious, which was quite often a term of respect of Lord. It's not rabbi to indicate him as a teacher. It's not the daskalos of a great teacher which would seem to be fitting given the fact that Jesus was just giving an address, almost indicating not really interested in what you're going to teach me. Instead, the Greek word is epistates, which, as Thayer says in his lexicon, wasn't really called because Jesus was a great teacher or teaching at all, but because of his position as an authority, almost as a, a superintendent role, kind of a you're the boss type of an approach. And so you can imagine in Peter's mind, he's looking at this situation. We've been out all night. We've caught nothing. We're the professional fishermen. We've just cleaned the nets, but you're the boss. We'll let down the nets. We'll go out. And so what does Peter do? He lets down the nets. And immediately... They're slammed with a great haul of fish, as we read in verse 6. When they had done this, they enclosed a great multitude of fish. And what Peter was about to learn was that this wasn't just a carpenter trying to tell a fisherman how to do his job. There was a much deeper lesson that he was going to learn. And so you can imagine Peter throwing this net over the side, maybe half holding on a bit, not really convinced anything's going to happen. And suddenly he's doubled down, holding on to the net, once again an indication of the strength of Peter. Peter's not the one breaking here, it's the net that's breaking. And he desperately calls out for his companions to bring the other boat over. So the other boat pulls over, and they start piling all of these fish into the boat. So many fish that the boats actually fill up. Now I wondered, well, how many fish would this be? Now I'm not a mathematician, so... I'm sorry, I'm not going to do as good as Stephen here, but I did do a, a rough kind of visionary for myself of when you take a look at these boats at this time, they, about 20 years ago, they uncovered a couple of Galilean fishing boats, and they didn't profess that they were associated with Jesus at all, but if they are indeed characteristic of that time period, they were about 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and about four and a half feet deep. So if you have a 27-foot-long boat that's seven and a half feet wide, two of them, how many fish would you be pulling in to completely fill up those fishing vessels? This was an absolute fortune that was coming in at this time. I don't think Peter would have ever seen anything like this, or anyone else for that matter. Pulling up a bunch of fish in the middle of the day, that's not when you fish. And so as they're piling all these things in, in the melee of it all, 
they find themselves in a bit of a different predicament. It kind of reminded me a little bit, uh, we're kind of in Sunday school picnic season right now, and we had our Sunday school picnic, and you put the ropes out, and we have a candy scramble, and all the candy goes into the middle, and all the kids kind of dive in, and they're, they're stuffing the candy into the bag, and, and sometimes in their overzealousness, they stuff too much candy into the bag, and the bag breaks, and they, they lose everything. Well, Peter and the others are kind of in this position now of where their focus changes because no longer is it just about making a fortune here, but the boats actually begin to sink is what we find at the end of verse 7. So not only are they in danger now of losing a great hull of fish, but now they're in danger of losing their boats and maybe even their lives because remember, they're out in the deep. And as Peter's frantically looking around for what he's supposed to be doing, he turns and looks, and he sees Jesus sitting there, totally unaffected, and totally unimpressed, and totally not surprised by what he's seeing before him. And with that, the weight of everything drops Peter to his knees. He falls to his knees and he says to Jesus, depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And you wonder why this response from Peter. He had just seen an amazing miracle. Wouldn't he be astonished? Wouldn't he just be absolutely enthralled? Jesus, this is amazing. But that's not the response that we get from Peter. Why is that? Perhaps it was because of the attitude that he had of washing the nets, of being disinterested when his master taught. The you're the boss approach when Jesus was speaking to him. The returning to fishing, perhaps for yet a third time after Jesus had called him. Perhaps it was everything that came crashing together that brought Peter to his knees to make this profession to his Lord. We're told that when Peter saw it, this was his response. It hits Peter with a sledgehammer force and it brings him to his knees as he makes this recognition of where he was at in relation to his Lord. It's almost as though Jesus is telling the disciples, you want to put business first? You want to put other things in front of the word of the kingdom? Well, I'll give you so much business. I'll give you so much success that it sinks you. And you'll go down with your treasure, with you on top of it. And I think when Peter realized this and the others, they knew that they had some changes to make. Sometimes we can naturally think that getting more is a blessing from God. And true, the things that we have are blessings from God. But when we focus on getting more, it leads us away from the kingdom. Jesus had just spoken to his disciples about how they couldn't serve two masters. It had just been spoken in the Sermon on the Mount. And it's the same thing for us, brothers and sisters. We don't have to have a lot to desire a lot. We can continue to want more and more, and that will lead us away from the kingdom. And Peter's brought to this realization here that he couldn't serve two masters. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. And they had toiled all night and had caught nothing. But Simon is told not to fear. This is all part of the process. Fear not is what he says in verse 10, for henceforth thou shalt catch men. Everything that Peter had caught up to this point had ended up dead. And now, Peter was going to catch men alive. How did he know that he was going to do this? Because he himself had just been caught alive. When you take a look at this word here that comes up of where it says in verse 9, for he was astonished, that actually means to be surrounded or seized. So Peter is actually surrounded or seized, caught with the rest of the fish not realizing that he himself was the one that was being fished out of the Sea of Galilee. And that's the same thing for each and every one of us. The Lord Jesus Christ is fishing us out of the Sea of Nations to give us the opportunity to follow him. Well, there's a difference, isn't there, brothers and sisters, between hearing the word of God and being committed to follow it in our lives. And it's so important that we truly make that commitment that we do the things that are necessary to show that we're committed to our Heavenly Father. What do our lives consist of? If we were to offer up our attendance record in the ecclesia to our boss at work, would we still have a job? What do we find ourselves doing throughout the week? 
Are we spending our time, our energy, our efforts on the things that are truly important? Or do we have that divided service of where we haven't yet made that commitment? Yes, getting baptized is the first step. How are we doing in regards to that commitment? And so from our first class together, we were reminded of the fact that Jesus first calls, but we have to be listening. That Jesus will require a change to our identity, not minor tweaks to our character, but a transformation to be made like Him. God knows that it takes time to commit, but we have to make the commitment. We have to give ourselves to God and to leave the other things behind. And we have to recognize our position when we're called. I'm a sinful man, a sinful woman, that we approach God with humility and that God calls us not based on who we are today, but based on who we are to become. So that once we commit, we can no longer look back. We need to keep moving forward. Commitment is the first step. Conversion will come later. And that conversion is a lifetime process. We must answer the call. And here we've seen Peter answering the call. He's made the commitment. And we're going to continue to walk with Peter as he learns what it means to be a disciple and to be converted to be the disciple that Jesus needed him to be.